The anime starts with our zesty main protagonist, Will, who was born into a world where magic reigns supreme, yet he had no magical abilities of his own. Determined to become the strongest magician, he chose to battle every monster in the dungeon with his sword. Living in a society that values magic above all, Will's lack of magical talent didn't discourage him. He enrolled in a prestigious academy, facing the challenge of succeeding in an environment where magic is everything. To overcome his disadvantage, Will honed his sword skills and regularly ventured into high-level dungeons, confronting giant beasts that attacked him with magical spells. He deftly dodged their attacks, using his incredible speed and swordsmanship to stylishly defeat them with a single slash. The next morning, an exhausted Will attended class, where Professor Edward taught the basics of alchemy, including the production of sulfur for explosives. Edward noticed Will was dozing off and called his name, startling him awake. Summons the front of the class to demonstrate the process, Will reluctantly took out his wand and attempted to conjure flames to create sulfur. However, to his dismay, not even a spark appeared, prompting laughter from his classmates. Edward then silenced them, looking at Will with disgust as he couldn't fathom how Will excelled in theory but failed in practical magic, questioning how he was even accepted into the academy. Suddenly, a cocky red-haired boy named Cheyenne used his wand to effortlessly produce flames and sulfur, while Will cowered behind the fire. However, Edward warned against unauthorized magic use and demonstrated the creation of a large crystal of sulfur, emphasizing that magic is paramount and essential for survival at the academy. He then advised those incapable of controlling magic to leave. After class, Cheyenne and his glazers taunted Will, mocking his ability to only defeat low-level dungeon monsters. But Will's childhood friend Cole intervened and defended Will's character, telling Cheyenne to back off. However, Cheyenne dismissed Cole's words, claiming that kindness and hard work were useless without magic, before walking away with his group. As Cole and Will walked together, Cole tried to reassure him, but Will seemed accustomed to the bullying. Gazing at the sky, he soon commented on its beauty. The scene then shifts to years ago, where humans were trapped in darkness, living in fear of evil spirits who cast a shadow over the world. Suddenly, five legendary mages, known as Magiavanders, fought the spirits and freed humanity, revealing the sky for the first time. This title now belongs to the world's most powerful mages. This story made will recall a promise he made to his childhood friend, Elfie, who inspired him with storybooks about the Magiavanders, and they vowed to become Magiavanders together. Elfie, possessing remarkable talent, fulfilled her promise and quickly rose to become the youngest Magiavander in history, now residing in the Divine Tower. However, Will turned out to be far below average, barely holding onto his dream and the promise he made. Later that day, he met with Professor Work, who angrily berated him for venturing into level 7 dungeons alone, warning him that he was risking his life. Will quickly bent over and apologized, but asked if he would receive credit for his efforts. With a sigh, he awarded him two credits. Work then asked if he still hadn't given up on becoming a Mangiavander. He explained that to have even a small chance, Will needed to get admitted to the Upper Institute, which required a lot of credits in spellwork, writing, and fighting. Without the ability to use spells, he would never get credits for spellwork, making it impossible to qualify. However, Will declared that he would keep trying, but Work informed him that he needed four more credits by the end of the week to graduate. This shocked Will, who immediately started searching for monsters that could earn him four credits. Playfully, he then mentioned a monster called Baskerville on the sixth floor that hadn't been defeated yet. Hearing this, Will hugged his teacher, but unbeknownst to them, Shine overheard and decided to head to the dungeon himself to kill the monster and get Will expelled for not having enough credits. Later that evening, Will entered the cave with his familiar, Kiki, instructing her to use her nose to find the monster. But Kiki hesitated, remembering how she was burned by a Baskerville's breath the last time. Meanwhile, Shine and his glazers entered the sixth floor, determined to find the beast before Will. Soon, one of Cheyenne's underlings, a pink-haired boy, questioned the wisdom of just three mages entering the sixth floor, but Cheyenne angrily claimed he was one of the best mages in the class and could handle it. He ordered his underlings to use their scan magic to locate the beast. Suddenly, a huge monster appeared and gave the spiky-haired boy a back shot so hard he became one with the wall. Cheyenne was paralyzed with shock while the pink-haired boy screamed in terror. Will, having heard the scream, immediately rushed toward the noise, worried someone was hurt. After turning a corner, he saw Shine on the floor, futilely shooting his tiny fireballs at a monster. Will recognized it as the Sentinel, an extremely strong monster worth 10 credits, and wondered what it was doing on this dungeon level. Realizing that Shine's magic was ineffective, he watched as the monster ignored the flames and advanced on the terrified boy. Initially, Will considered helping but remembered all the times Cyan had ridiculed him. He wanted to close his eyes and pretend he hadn't seen it. 
However, he recalled Elfie, who once told him he was the kindest person she knew, and had gifted him a pair of glasses. This memory reminded him of who he truly was. He then put on the glasses, blocking the monster's attack just in time, and forced it away, saving Cheyenne's life. Back at the academy, Edward entered Work's room and urgently told him to send his familiar into the dungeons, as Shan and his lackeys had gone to the sixth floor without permission. Work soon realizes what has happened, but reassures Edward, noting that Will is also on the same floor. Back in the dungeon, Will clashes with the monster repeatedly, blocking its attacks and outmaneuvering it before swiftly slicing off one of its fingers. The enraged monster attempts to strike again, but Will dodges, moving through the air swiftly. However, the monster finally catches Will, but he blocks the blow with his sword, getting blasted back. The monster then hurls rocks at him, which he effortlessly slashes through. Seeing an opening, Will leaps around the monster, landing on its back and stabs it through the neck, while Cheyenne watches in shock, stunned by Will's abilities. Back at the academy, Edward is also stunned, while Work explains that although Will is an outcast with no magic, he possesses superhuman strength for a mage, the resilience of a dwarf, and a mind so sharp he can learn any attack pattern just by observing it once. They watch as Will slashes off the monster's arm and calmly walks toward a giant buster sword on the ground, picking it up effortlessly. Work turns to Edward, noting that in a world dominated by magic and wizards, Will is the lone warrior. The monster then shoots an energy beam from its mouth, but Will blocks it again with the giant sword and slashes the monster into pieces. The monster soon falls to the ground, lifeless, and Will approaches Cyan, extending a helping hand to the still shocked boy. Back at the academy, Edward, unable to believe his eyes, screams at work, insisting that someone without magic can never surpass a magician and storms out of the room. Five years ago, when Will was ten, he was humiliated by all his schoolmates. Many believe he had only been brought to the academy to attract Lady Elferia. But now that she had become a Magia Vander, they felt Will was no longer needed at the school, especially since he couldn't use magic. Among everyone at the institution, only Professor Work supported him, accompanying him to a meeting with Cauldron Anuv, the headmistress of the academy. There Will was presented with a sword, but was immediately attacked by numerous spells. He threw the professor aside and dealt with each attack. Seeing this, Cauldron allowed Will to continue attending the academy, noting that a sword trying to be a wand was quite an interesting case. Will then asked if he would be allowed to climb the tower if he continued studying, but Cauldron explained that he needed extraordinary willpower to pursue that goal. In the present, in one of his classes, Work teaches that climbing the tower means advancing to the higher institute to become a Mangia Vander, who reigns on the top floor of the Mercedes Collies and are recognized by the highest center of learning, the higher institute. There are two main methods to advance, creating a new type of magic or earning at least 7,200 credits at the academy. Since few can achieve the first option, most strive for the second. However, graduation itself is not easy, and that's why Work offers so many extra classes. After one of these classes, Colette comments that the professor is being tough on the students, Will also notices this himself as he is in disaster with magic and needs to focus entirely on earning credits to survive at the academy. However, he believes work does this for everyone's benefit, wanting everyone to have a chance to graduate. But Colette thinks that Professor Edward doesn't have the same dedication to giving extra classes and agrees with Will's perspective. As they walked down the hallway, they saw Lyral Mars boasting that Shine had defeated an evil sentinel, trying to steal the credit from the true slayer of the powerful beast. There, everyone in the group admired the young prodigy's false feat, but Cheyenne knew it wasn't true. In reality, he had been saved by the last person he would want to owe anything to, Will, whom he had humiliated all his life. As Will passed through the corridor, Cheyenne broke through the circle and grabbed Will by the collar, incredulous that someone he considered talentless could perform such a feat. Seeing this, Colette intervened, telling Cheyenne to stop. But as Cheyenne wanted to punch Will, he restrained himself and let him go. As he walked away, his glazers followed him and Colette asked if there was any conflict between them to cause such a reaction. Will then replies that there was, but brushes it off as nothing major. Later, Edward tried to convince the headmistress to expel Will, arguing that a warrior should not be accepted at an institution known for training the greatest mages in existence. He claimed it was impossible for someone to graduate without being able to use magic. Cauldron, however, noted that Will had excellent writing grades and his reports were so insightful that he stood out academically. Taking this into consideration, Cauldron suggested that Will could be a healer or an artificer even if he didn't become a Mangia Vander. She reminded the staff that the school's duty was to train and educate scholars for the fateful day. But Edward countered, arguing that Will had no intention of becoming a scholar, only a Mangia Vander. However, Cauldron acknowledged that this was a problem, so she asked Edward to test the student as he had discovered Will's secret. The headmistress then placed Will's promotion or expulsion in Edward's hands. But Edward questioned if that was truly what she wanted. 
pointing out that he's not as forgiving as work. She wanted Edward to test Will thoroughly and determine the truth for himself. Noting that as the Dark Viper Mage, Edward was uniquely suited to evaluate potential Mangiavanders. Meanwhile, Will needed Colette's help just to open his locker, as he is unable to use the simplest magic to unlock it. Ironically, despite his unique abilities, Will couldn't carry his sword on campus, and if he returned to the dormitory, his roommate would never let him leave. However, Colette remarked that they seemed to get along well, but Will unconvincingly responded that it was just a normal relationship. Later in the study room, Will read about the Battle of Barzaronso in the year 344 of the Magical Era. In this conflict, the dwarves, a race from another world, rebelled against exploitation and mistreatment worse than that of the elves, forming an army to free themselves. Seeing Will study something he had reviewed numerous times, Colette tried to give him a hint. However, he was intentionally analyzing the historical context from other races' perspectives. Colette soon praised Will's writing talent but thought he didn't mean to try so hard. Nonetheless, Will didn't want to lose his single credit and miss his chance to fulfill his dream. He understood that the dwarves' perspective in the battle was valuable, as it showed they could fight despite powerful magic, resonating with Will's daily experiences at school. While also mentioning that one of the dwarves' sayings from the war was to never give up, which Will took to heart. However, Edward suddenly arrived to summon Will for the test in the spell hall. The teacher explained he was there to personally assess Will's worth, ordering him to land a single blow. If he succeeded, he would receive five credits, but if he failed, he would be expelled. He notes that he believed those without talent for sorcery shouldn't consider becoming a Mangiavander. Simultaneously, Headmistress Cauldron called work, revealing the confrontation happening at that moment. She warned work not to interfere, explaining how she allowed him to make special interventions with Will outside the regular curriculum. Edward also had the right to implement his method. Being such a respected mage, Work found this test unfair knowing Edward was the man who almost became a Mangiavander. Back at the hall, Edward cast powerful spells against the inexperienced student who dodged as best he could. Even though they were low-level dark magics, they still had unmatched potency. With his place at the school at stake, Will didn't want to fall behind advancing with his above-average speed. Despite this, Edward's defense was impenetrable, and he protected himself without moving, maintaining distance through his magic. Edward then continued to disdain the student, reaffirming that he was hopeless. With that said, Edward cast a spell that shattered Will's glasses and he soon noticed that Edward was casting spells without reciting, activating them with frightening speed. As if that weren't enough, Will started coughing up blood, his body's fatigue telling him he wouldn't even be able to scratch his rival. With Will on the ground, Edward warned that he would only use two spells, his black flames to burn and his shield to repel the boy's unpleasant savagery. Quoting one of the Academy's doctrines, Edward taught that a student incapable of mastering a thousand spells should strive to master a single one, which would become like a thousand arrows. With that, Edward layered several spells into one, creating an endless spiral of magic before unleashing it all on Will, stating that those without talent should disappear. The series of spells relentlessly hit Will with brutal force, leaving him no chance to react. For the first time, Will faced a high-level mage and couldn't even wield his sword in this test. Back in the locker room, Colette wondered if her friend was okay, suspecting Edward's test was more like a torture session. But suddenly, Kiki appeared, bleeding and scratching at Will's locker, so Colette opened it to see what the familiar wanted to convey. Meanwhile, Edward took advantage of Will's study of the Dwarf Rebellion to ask how many mages it took to exterminate the 10,000 dwarves. Without letting Will answer, he informed him that only one sorcerer was enough because that's how the world works. Edward believed Will should give up his stupid dream. However, despite the world's harshness, Will made it clear he didn't intend to give up. Holding the glasses given by Elferia, he stated that he wanted to be by the side of the person he loved, fulfilling the promise he made to her. But Edward found this desire dirty and immoral, claiming a pathetic love couldn't be the motivation to aspire to the pinnacle of sorcery. Ignoring the teacher's insults, Will assured that he would see the sunset with his friend. At that moment, guided by Kiki, Colette threw the sword to Will and the feared blade of Moria cut through Edward's spell. Mercilessly, the teacher unleashed a new magical onslaught, engulfing Will's body like a purple inferno. As Will's arms and legs trembled, he was certain that he would be burned alive in the middle of the school. Initially, he thought of running away, but doing so meant his definitive expulsion from the academy and the end of his dream. Therefore, he advanced through the magical obstacles using his blade as a torch in the darkness. Reflecting on the Battle of Garzaranza, it will recall that a brave dwarf general named Gareth had fought even after losing all his brothers, striking a single blow against the enemy mage. In honor of his bravery, the mages began to recognize the dignity of the dwarf rebellion. That day became known as the day the sword overcame the wand. As if he were Gareth, 
will use his skills to break through Edward's blockade and make his face bleed with the sharp blade of Moria. Indignant, Edward withdrew and granted the five credits as a reward. Back in the headmistress's office, Cauldron and Work analyzed Will's brilliantly executed strategy and acknowledged his fearlessness. That night, in the vicinity of the Magic Academy, someone prepared a meal, waiting for Will to join them for dinner. Suddenly, the scene shifts to the day Elferia called Will the kindest and bravest person she knew, giving him the special glasses as her parting gift. It was the day she had to go to the tower forever, having already become a Magiavander. As she walked away, Will cried out Elferia's name, vowing to reach the tower no matter what. It was then, where he promised they would see the sunset together, just as they had promised each other in childhood. Tears filled Elferia's eyes as she heard this, and she turned around, wiping her tears, and told Will that she would be waiting for him. Soon after, Elferia climbed the stairs of the tower, leaving Will alone and heartbroken. Professor Work tried to comfort him, but it only made him cry harder. But that day, Will promised the professor that it was the last time he would be a pathetic crybaby. In the present, Will is working early in the morning, delivering newspapers in the city. After finishing his route, an old bulky man named Don greets him and encourages him to do his best. He hastily climbs a flight of stairs but trips, sending all the newspapers flying. But with lightning-fast reflexes and nimble arms, he grabs all the newspapers in an instant. However, one newspaper escapes his grasp. When Will picks it up, he finds an article about Elferia, who has just created another type of magic. Turns out, she has become the first mage in history to create 12 types of magic. This news fills Will with determination to work hard, so he can stand by her side. As he reads further, he discovers that Elferia herself has issued an order to the Academy students. Will freaks out upon learning this and immediately runs to his dorm. There he meets his roommate, Rusty, asking him to make a magic device for him. But when Rusty asks about his excitement, Will explains the order Elferia has issued and his intention to participate. He then changes into his uniform while telling Rosti that the order is to procure the cores of monsters called Frostwalkers from the fourth floor of the dungeon, explaining that Elferia needs them as catalysts and every student who helps will be rewarded. He once again asks Rosti to prepare a magic item to help him clear the fourth floor. Seeing him so excited, Rosti starts laughing and reveals he has already been working on the magic item that Will uses from time to time. He then hands it to Will who thanks him and heads out. But before he exits the door, Rusty stops him, stuffs bread into his mouth, and asks him to take care of himself. The scene then shifts to Will reaching the fourth floor of the dungeon, finding it crowded with students hunting frost walkers for their cores. Just as he is about to join the action, a huge explosion rattles him. Turns out, it is Cyan's attack which obliterates a bunch of frost walkers in one go. While his glazers suck up to him, Cyan is not satisfied. Deep inside, he is still thinking about his fight with Will and the giant monster fueling his rage and motivating him to become stronger. Unaware of this, Will genuinely believes that Cheyenne is cool and thinks there is nothing left for him to hunt. He then heads deeper into the fourth floor and comes face to face with giant penguin monsters. With a few clean strikes, he slashes the penguin monsters, saving a nerdy girl who was about to be killed by them. The girl is dumbfounded, unable to comprehend how Will defeated the monsters using a sword instead of magic. But as soon as he approaches her, she thanks him for saving her life before proceeding to introduce herself as Iris, a fourth-year student at the Academy. Meanwhile, inside the Academy, Professor Work is giving a lecture about the greatness of creating new types of spells, which alone is enough to make the mage who created the magic climb the tower. He explains that new magic forms are usually named after their creators, and if anyone in the class ever creates a new magic, they will etch their name in history. The students begin go sipping, considering this approach impractical since only the top 0.1% can manage to do it. Just then, a student named Rose asks Professor Work if Elferia, who has created 12 new forms of magic, is really that good. He responds by saying that she is exceptionally talented, calling her one of the greatest mages in the entire history of their world. This makes Cole remark that the childhood friend Will is chasing after is truly special. Her friend Rose soon teases her, suggesting that she is jealous Elferia might steal her crush, Will, away from her. Back in the dungeon, Will is walking with Iris, who has heard about the talentless book learner of the sixth year. Will is hurt by this but asks her if she doesn't feel any disdain towards a loser like him. However, Iris curiously responds that she can't look down on her savior, explaining that even if Will doesn't have magic, she respects him for his special talents. He is flustered and changes the topic to the order issued by Elferia. She then also says that she wants to help the Magiavander who hold up the sky. Her words make Will think about how no one in this world has seen the true sky, as the enormous magic power of the five Magiavander cloaks their world, hiding it from invaders. 
What they currently see is the false sky, a great barrier that keeps their world safe. But according to the lore, when the fake sky falls, darkness will shroud the world again and chaos will follow. That's why the students meeting orders are not just trying to get into the good graces of the Magia Vander, but they also want to support the sky from falling. He soon snapped from his thoughts as Iris tells him that she has met Elferia before, reciting the story of how she was in trouble in the dungeon one day surrounded by all kinds of scary monsters. Just as she was waiting for her death, all the monsters were suddenly frozen. It was then, Iris turned around to see Elferia gleaming in the sunlight looking like a goddess. Elferia helped her up gently and ever since then, Iris has admired her deeply. While Iris is busy telling the story, Kiki gains Will's attention and leads him to a patch on the ground that has something. Confused, Iris asks him what he is doing, and Will shows her an ice fragment that the Frostwalkers leave behind as they move. However, the fragment here is really big, and now Will is certain that a rather powerful Frostwalker is ahead. As he begins walking toward the cave in front of them, Iris asks him how he can be so sure since she couldn't find any trace of the Frostwalkers using her search magic. Will then tells her that magic is great, but is not absolute, especially in the dungeon. Will tells Iris that along with his belief, he also has some knowledge and experience. Suddenly, a giant frost walker, hidden on the ceiling, pounces at the unguarded Iris. However, Will had anticipated this, so he moved quickly, taking Iris to safety. Iris then recognizes the giant ice monster with dozens of eyes as a frost rex, the highest evolved form of a frost walker. As the monster roars loudly, Iris recalls that a Frost Rex is a monster worth six credits, making it very dangerous. Suddenly, the monster charges an ice beam and fires it, but Will jumps out of the line of fire which is soon covered with sharp ice spikes. He then leaves Iris in a safe spot as he heads to fight the monster. But Iris tries to stop him, telling him that physical attacks won't work on a Frost Rex, whose power is so strong it can freeze even the sturdy dwarves with a single touch. However, as Will puts on the magic tool made by Roasty, he reassures Iris not to worry because he has defeated the monster numerous times already. He then charges towards the Frost Rex, avoiding its ice beam by jumping up, landing on the ground behind the Frost Rex, and speeds towards it, sliding underneath it. The monster, unable to find Will, begins shooting the ice beam everywhere, forcing Iris and Kiki to run away. Will then encircles the monster while it is distracted and throws the magic tool over it, which attaches to the monster's side through a hook. He wraps around the monster, tightening a strong rope around it that cracks its skin. Once Will has succeeded in laying out the framework for his final attack, the monster uses a cold breath that begins freezing Will's skin, but Will stays put, knowing that his work is almost done. He then explains that the Frost Rex is weak to fire and explosions, and that is exactly what he is going to use. Will soon creates friction on the magic tool in his hand, sending a swift flame that travels down the rope and ultimately reaches the magic tool, shattering the giant monster into bits. As the smoke and steam settle, Will recoils the magic tool Roasty made for him, and then goes to collect the ice core of the fallen monster. Having watched, Will defeat the giant monster without magic. Iris' expression suddenly changes. It turns out she was not the knave girl she was pretending to be, but an agent of someone higher up the tower. There she has discovered that the talentless Will is stronger than what she had heard and wonders how to report this to her superiors. However, as Will tells her they should head back now, she resumes her act and goes with him. Later, Iris reaches the White Tower and goes to the room on the top where four of the five Mangia Vanders are seated on their thrones. It turns out they are looking for skilled people who can help their world prepare for the day the sky falls. She reports that she saw great talent in the magicless boy called Will and recommends he be let into the tower. But two of the Mangia Vanders are strictly opposed to this. However, the white-haired guy named Zio is interested. He then mentions that he is willing to let anyone skilled stand by his side, even if it is a dwarf. But the elf bro is not happy to hear that because elves believe dwarves are barbarians. However, Red Hair stops them from fighting and says they don't have to make any decision now because they can wait to see Will's performance in the grand festival that is going to take place soon. Everyone agrees to this and soon leaves one by one, leaving only Elfaria in the room. It was then revealed that Iris was sent after Will by Elfaria herself, before taking out the giant ice core he sent her, as she repeated her promise to wait forever for Will. A few days pass, and the big day for the final combat exam arrives. All the students gather in the examination hall. Their Shine and Cole are the first to face their opponents, special mechanical golems they must defeat to earn points. Shine is highly motivated and uses his Flame Blast to destroy any golems that come near him. Meanwhile, Cole is more strategic. She uses the debris from Shine's attacks to her advantage. With her teleportation magic, she teleports the falling rocks on top of the golems, crushing them into pieces. The instructor shouts from above, announcing that both Cole and Cyan have passed the final examination with enough credits to advance to the higher institute. 
Meanwhile, Will is trying to find a way to defeat the massive golems. With his wand in hand, he dodges and ducks around them, unable to use magic himself. He tries to slip through the golems' attacks to find an opening for a punch, but the other students mock him, saying this is a magical academy, not a fight club. Distracted, Will gets hit by a golem and is thrown to the ground. As he contemplates his situation, he looks at others in positions he feels he can never achieve. Suddenly, a blonde girl named Lehanna uses her lightning magic to create arrows, which she uses to impale the golems in front of her, frying their circuits and destroying them. Another student, a green-haired boy named Wigmel, uses his wind magic to create a tornado, shredding a golem into pieces. The instructor then also announces that both have passed the test, and the next student enters the arena. Julius, a blue-haired boy known for his powerful ice magic, swiftly freezes all the nearby golems in a wall of ice, incapacitating them. He walks through them with an air of superiority, and the instructor announces that Julius has passed as well. He then approaches both Wignall and Lehanna, who are the only other students with scores over 10,000. Julius then tells them that he has found a way to easily overpower them and creates a small flower, throwing it at them as a sign of disrespect. But Wignall shreds it with his wind magic, and Lehanna destroys what remains with her lightning magic before walking away. Meanwhile, Will slumps against a pillar, feeling depressed. Not only is he far from reaching the higher institute, but he also lacks the 2,000 points needed to graduate as he only has a score of 55,000. He fears it will be nearly impossible to achieve, especially in his last year at the academy. However, he soon notices Julius walking by with his lackeys and stands up to show respect. But Julius calls him a loser and moves on, treating him like an insignificant piece of trash. Later that afternoon, Will goes to have lunch and is joined by Cole. She encourages him not to be so down, reminding him that he still has a chance to advance to the higher institute. Cole then tells him about the upcoming Grand Mage Festival, which could be his biggest opportunity to earn a direct ticket to the upper institute, regardless of his credits. Turns out, the Grand Mage Festival is a significant event held every two years, where the most talented wizards and witches showcase their skills. There, anonymous scouts from the upper institutes attempt to look for talent. This festival is crucial for all students as catching the eye of a scout could change their lives, allowing them to be promoted regardless of their credits. But there is also the possibility of being directly selected into one of the four factions, the Wind Faction, the Flame Faction, the Lightning Faction, and the Ice Faction. However, Will remains unconvinced, reminding Cole that such promotions are rare and that he prefers to work behind the scenes. He soon recalls the event two years ago when he participated as a challenger and was booed by the crowd, accused of cheating because he didn't know how to use magic. They then look outside to see the grounds filled with students practicing their magic to prepare for the festival. However, Will has lost his confidence and heads to his locker room, saying that since he can't use magic, it's pointless for him to enter. Suddenly, Cole notices a magical barrier near one of the lockers. With the help of Kiki, she manages to break it. It was then they discovered a hidden staircase leading down into darkness. Both Cole and Will decide to follow the stairs as they can hear sounds coming from below. They are shocked to find that this secret hideaway is an underground gambling den, which is completely illegal. The students below are placing bets on who will win the festival, with most of them betting on Lehama, Wignall, and Julius. Suddenly, Will notices that Cyan is there with his followers looking down with hidden anger in his eyes. Cyan immediately gets mad at Will for no apparent reason, but Cole warns him not to start any pointless fights. Will soon realizes that Cyan is insecure about his position in the betting, since not many people are betting on him to win. However, Cyan proudly declares that he is just as good as Wignall and Lehanna, but is trailing points because he got off to a bad start with his coursework. Cole then teases him for being jealous, but he pushes her aside and angrily walks away. That night, Will returns to his part-time job working in a tavern owned by a lady named Janna. The night is lively as people fill the tavern for food and drink. He immediately goes out to serve all the dwarves who are there to eat, and they all seem to know and like Will. One of the older dwarves named Don, asks Will why he works so hard, noting that he delivers newspapers in the morning, attends school, and then works in the tavern in the evenings. However, Will explains that since he doesn't have any scholarships, this is the only way he can pay for his tuition. Janna tells him to stop yapping and get back to work, because they are short on workers tonight. Thankfully, Rosty, a good friend, decides to lend a helping hand and covers for the other workers for the shift. Later, when the tavern is less crowded, Will thanks Rosty for his help. He asks why Will doesn't ask Professor Walk to find him a job, noting that the dwarves probably don't pay him much. But Will replies that he doesn't want to create more problems for Professor Work, and he enjoys working at the tavern because the dwarves don't discriminate against him. He then also adds that he respects them for their strength in battle and their craftsmanship. 
Suddenly, the door opens, and the blue-haired Julius enters the tavern with a look of disgust. He asks his glazers why they'd brought him to such a rundown place, and they reply that it was the only place open at that moment. But as soon as Julius notices Will standing behind the bar, cleaning up, he starts laughing, mocking him by saying that it suits Will since a loser with no magical talent can only fit in with the ugly, disgusting, and pathetically weak dwarves. This enrages Don, who gets up from his seat in anger, but another dwarf stops him, knowing that if a dwarf lays a hand on a mage, it could mean a death sentence for them. Julius, however, looks at Don with disgust, telling him to keep his eyes down where they belong and to thank the mages for allowing third-class creatures like dwarves to even exist on this planet. He then sits on one of the benches and demands to be served food. Soon after, Rusty brings him a dish of beans, but Julius and his party mock the food, claiming it's peasant food that even their dogs wouldn't eat. Hearing all this disrespect, something snaps in Will. He takes off his apron and walks up to Julius, demanding he take back his insults. Julius, not wanting a given, kicks the food at Will, further disrespecting him. His glazers then get up to deal with Will, but this time Will is not playing around. He grabs them by their collars and smashes them into the floor, knocking them out immediately. This causes drinks to splatter all over Julius, making him furious. He then draws his wand and starts attacking Will with magical icicles. But Will dodges the ice shards, which shatters glasses around him. Julius continues to pursue him using his magic to corner and trap Will completely. He then walks up to Will and presses a frosty hand on his chest, slowing down his heartbeat as he tries to scare Will into submission. This tactic fails as Will doesn't flinch and glares straight at Julius. Enraged, Julius releases Will from the icy shackles, declaring that this isn't enough punishment. He claims that he wants to humiliate Will in front of the entire city and all the great mages and challenges Will to join the Grand Mage Festival for a duel against him, promising that if Will wins, he will apologize to the disgusting dwarves. However, if Will loses, he will torture him and force him to leave the magical academy for good. Will, with newfound resolve, grabs his wand and declares that he will definitely enter the festival and ensure Julius' defeat at any cost. The Grand Magic Festival is now underway and excitement is in the air as everyone gathers to witness the students showcase their abilities. The Fire Faction's scout advises his team to be on the lookout for any students with the potential to become a Magia Vander, as talent can be hard to spot at first glance. The first event of the day is the highly anticipated Dragon Races, where Leanna has held a strong lead over her competitors, thrilling the crowd. Meanwhile, a variety of recruiters from both the Tower and beyond are also in attendance, eager to recruit the school's top talent. But to no one's surprise, Lehanna wins the Dragon Race, setting a new record in the process. The next event is Crown Attack, and Cheyenne is set to participate. He is in a particularly good mood because Colette personally asked him to join her team. It seems she has finally acknowledged his exceptional skills and prefers to team up with him rather than Will. However, when Cheyenne enters the training room, he is shocked to find Will there as well. Colette explains that she invited Cyan to join a team with her and Will, as Will needs a team with a combined total of 21,000 credits to compete in the crown attack. Due to Will's low credits, Colette could only turn to Cyan to fill the final spot. Will apologizes for dragging Cyan into his problems, but Cyan is reluctant to help him. He wonders why Will is suddenly interested in competing in an upper-level event like Crown Attack. While Cyan is venting his frustration, he locks eyes with Julius and realizes that Julius is the sole focus of Will's attention. Colette clarifies that something happened between Julius and Will, prompting Will's sudden determination to participate in Crown Attack at any cost. But Cyan is enraged by Will's apparent disregard for him as he is still haunted by feelings of inferiority since Will saved him in the dungeon. As the next event is about to begin, the commentator Mike introduces himself alongside co-commentator Professor Edward. Despite Mike's reservations about Edward's presence, given his reputation as the school's most feared and strict professor, he continues with the show, albeit with a sense of fear. Mike then announces the main event of the day, the crown attack. Soon after, a spell transforms the stadium into an expansive battle map featuring a volcano zone, marshland zone, badlands zone, plant zone, and wood zone. Unlike other events, Crown Attack is a team competition with three-member teams. Each team starts at the perimeter of the field and must make its way to the central stadium, where a giant crown awaits. The first team to claim the crown will emerge victorious. However, this is no simple task as the battlefield is laden with various traps. Teams can take shortcuts and obstruct others, making it a brutal battle royale. Edward adds that the event simulates a practical dungeon raid though most spectators are more eager to see high-level battles among the school's top students. Hypothetically, if there were an illegal gambling ring at the school, which there absolutely isn't, Will's team would be the least favored, with the worst odds. Students soon laugh at Will's audacity to compete in crown attack, doubting his abilities. 
But despite this, Wu remains unfazed, determined to prove himself. As participants head to their starting positions, Worker is stunned to see Will ready to compete. However, Professor Work tries to dissuade Will, but Will's mind is made up. He apologizes to Professor Work for not listening, but insists that this is a challenge he is determined to win, no matter the ridicule he faces. With all participants in place, the Crown Attack event officially begins. As students rush forward, Julius's team is the first to encounter traps, which trigger an army of golems blocking their path. Such a formidable obstacle would be a major setback for many students. However, Will charges ahead, undeterred by the swarm of golems despite his inability to use magic or defeat a single golem during practice. Will continues his advance, signaling to Colette, who casts a spell to create a magical gauntlet for him. Armed with the gauntlet, Will demolishes the golems in his path, leaving the spectators in awe of his unexpected prowess. Professor Work, however, is not surprised. He anticipated that Will, wielding a magic gauntlet, would be capable of inflicting significant damage, even without his sword. Since Colette created the gauntlet, it technically adheres to the rules. Contrary to all predictions and the illegal betting odds, Will is the first to break through the golem horde, heading straight for the crown. Ever since Will saved him, Shine has replayed that moment repeatedly in his mind, considering it one of his greatest failures. He would rather have faced death than endure such profound humiliation. Shine has been pushing himself to the limit, determined to build up every ounce of strength possible. Despite his efforts, Will still manages to outshine him in the crown attack event even without using magic. This then causes Will's team to take a significant lead in the race to reach a stadium and claim the crown, leaving other competitors scrambling to keep up. Upon reaching the Badlands zone, more traps are triggered, firing rock bullets at Will and his teammates. Will stops using his gauntlet to punch the ground and create a rock wall to block the bullets. He then asks Colette for assistance and she casts unlimited blade works that conjures a dozen swords for Will. He uses these swords as projectiles to destroy the obstacles in their path. Mike announces that Will's team has easily navigated through the Badlands, encountering no traps that pose a real challenge, thanks to their teamwork. Although Cheyenne has yet to contribute significantly, some spectators attempt to downplay Will's skills, claiming that Colette's magic is doing most of the work. While her magic is crucial, the effectiveness of their strategy is due to Will's skillful technique. Scouts begin to notice Will's exceptional ability to detect and counter traps, and even Edward, who doesn't favor Will, acknowledges his hard work. Will's time spent in dungeons has honed his movements and enhanced his reflexes, allowing him to exploit even the smallest openings. One opposing team grows frustrated, unable to accept being outperformed by someone without magic. Their hatred for Will distracts them, causing them to fall into a flower trap and be eaten alive. Other teams face similar setbacks due to the traps. But despite these brutal obstacles, Will's team maintains the lead. The tournament has stirred a commotion in the stadium, audible even to Julius. Curious about the event's status, Julius's teammates use a detection spell to survey the competition. They see that Will is significantly ahead, prompting Julius's team to consider taking action against him to prevent a loss. Yet Julius remains confident, having devised a plan to deal with Will personally. Meanwhile, Will and his team arrive the final area before the arena, Enchanted Woods. As Will charges in first, he triggers several magic circles at once, realizing it's a chain circle trap. However, he already has a solution. By skillfully manipulating the area around each circle, he causes the spells to cancel each other out by firing at one another, resulting in an explosion. Mike enthusiastically announces Will's successful navigation of the forest traps, and he teasingly asks Edward for his thoughts, knowing Edward set up the dark magic minefield. With a substantial lead, Will approaches the stadium, increasing the likelihood of encountering and being attacked by another team. He's had to eliminate several teams along the way, but he's particularly focused on ambushing Julius. However, as Will moves to secure a vantage point, Julius surprises him by firing an icicle at him. Though it doesn't directly hit Will, he is shocked at how Julius could have caught up so quickly. Moreover, Julius appears to be alone, raising concerns that his teammates might be lying in wait. Julius begins casting a barrage of icicles at Will, forcing him to evade and focus on the immediate threat. Just then, Cheyenne gets serious, preparing to unleash a powerful inferno. Noticing Cheyenne's intense gaze on Will, Colette warns him that Cheyenne might be targeting him. As Cyan releases his spell, Colette conjures a rock wall to protect Will from the fiery blast. The explosion sends a shockwave across the battlefield, leaving Will momentarily bewildered. After the explosion, he soon surveys the scene and sees the forest has been incinerated. Cyan then approaches Will, claiming that Julius was collateral damage. However, Colette is certain Cyan intended to kill Will. Colette demands an explanation from Cyan, who feels justified in his actions, but he mentioned that he had joined their team to enable Will's participation in the event. 
and now he wants repayment by having a one-on-one -on -one fight with Will. Confused, Will questions the timing of Cheyenne's challenge, but Cheyenne is uninterested in explanations, firing a warning shot to emphasize his demand. Colette attempts to intervene, but is blocked by a wall of ice from Julius, who miraculously survived the blast. With Colette in danger, Will wants to help her, but Cheyenne insists on a duel. Cheyenne then launches fireballs, knocking Will's sword from his hand and urges him to retrieve it for their battle. The scene then shifts to Cheyenne's reflection on how, from the beginning, he found Will to be insufferable. He perceived Will as a nuisance, which led him to try and mold Will into someone more tolerable. When Will was younger, Cheyenne offered him the position of his subordinate, but Will disregarded him. Frustrated, Cheyenne grabbed Will to get his attention, but Will simply told him to step aside. Cheyenne retreated, recognizing the determination in Will's eyes. As Will walked away, Cheyenne followed him and noticed Will gazing at the tower. From that moment on, Cheyenne believed that Will would never see them as a hindrance, which sparked a deep-seated resentment within him. In the present, Cheyenne unleashes a barrage of fire spells at Will, but Will skillfully dodges each one. However, Cheyenne manages to ensnare Will with a rope of flames, hurling him into the air before launching a fireball. Will blocks the attack, prompting Cheyenne to taunt him, asking if dodging and blocking are all he can do. Cheyenne urges Will to fight back, but Will refuses, reminding Cheyenne that they are still a team. He insisted on winning and keeping his promise to Donnan and the others. But this made Cheyenne impatient and demanded that Will stop talking and fight. He attacks again, but Will evades once more, wondering if they truly have no choice but to battle. Meanwhile, back at the academy, the other students learn that their squad has fallen into disarray. Mike declares this development a major upset and asks Edward for his thoughts. However, Edward comments that infighting among teammates is never good, regardless of the reasons, and predicts that the scouts will deduct points for this. But deep inside, he secretly feels pleased, thinking that Will won't be chosen by the scouts if this continues. The scouts then observes Cyan's performance, acknowledging that he has done well so far, but note that he's still just a kid. They observe that while Cyan has the fourth highest credits of the academy, his attitude poses a problem. Rusty, concerned for Will, wonders what will happen next. But suddenly, Iris approaches Rusty and asks if she can sit beside him. He instantly recognizes her, and it's revealed that they've met before. Rusty allows her to sit, and she begins to cheer for Will. But he is soon taken aback that she's cheering for just one student and mentions that he thought she was more reserved. However, Iris explains that someone introduced her to Will, and though she initially had no intention of getting to know him, now she is captivated by him. Rosti, realizing Will's popularity, remarks that even Cyan is so drawn to Will that he's fighting him now. Iris then playfully asks if Rosti is included in this group of admirers, to which Rosti confesses that he is, adding that he loves Will more than anything else. Iris then also comments that Rosti's love seems intense, and he agrees, explaining that as Will's roommate, he feels deeply connected, which is kinda sus. He then also adds that he believes that Cole shares the same sentiment. At the same time, Cole has managed to escape and is running from Julius' attacks, determined to stop Cheyenne and Will from fighting. Julius taunts her, saying that if she keeps running away, her title as the Earth Princess will be tarnished. Annoyed by the nickname, Cole defends herself from his ice spears with an earth wall, but Julius triggers a trap that ensnares her. The students observe something strange happening in the contest, noticing that Julius appears to be fighting everyone at once. They speculate about how there could be so many copies of him and it becomes clear that Julius is preventing all the teams from advancing. Wignall, on his way to the stadium, also encounters Julius and wonders if Julius is there to make good on his declaration of war. Julius acknowledges that he did say he would use his trump card to defeat him, but before he can attack, Wignall returns a rose to him. This caught Julius off guard, allowing Wignall to launch an attack, which seemingly defeats Julius, only for Wignall to realize that it was merely a clone. However, Mike, who has bet his entire fortune on Wignall, is happy to see his glorious king defeat Julius. Nearby, an elf named Leflia Viridis asks another elf, Vilfus Chalia, how she would rate the elven students at the academy. Vilfus then blowmy states that they are as good as expected, if not slightly better, which Leflia finds harsh. But Chalia, being an introvert, expresses her desire to leave the festive environment, which is ignored by Leflia, who's busy contemplating how she should report this to Eleanor. The students then speculate that the winner will likely be either Julius's squad or Wignall's squad and express relief at Will's squad seems to have ruined their chances. They are glad as they don't want someone they consider talentless to win. But one of Cheyenne's followers notices something off about Cheyenne's behavior. He knows Cheyenne hates Will but is surprised by how far he's willing to go during the Grand Magic Games. The scene then shifts to the blazing forest, where Will questions why Cheyenne is doing this to him. 
He recalls how, as a child, he was constantly harassed by other students at the academy for being labeled a no-talent. But Will never understood why they bullied him, as he had done nothing to provoke them. He accepted the label of no-talent, which is why he never sought recognition or acted selfishly. He just wanted to be left alone. However, when Cyan confronted him back then, Will simply asked to be left alone as his only focus was on catching up to Elferia as quickly as possible. In the present, Cheyenne summons a fire guardian in the form of a hawk and sends it to attack Will. He manages to slice through the guardian's wings, but it regenerates rapidly, revealing its high-speed healing abilities. Will quickly realizes that to defeat the fire guardian, he must destroy its core. As both Cyan and the guardian launch a coordinated attack, Will manages to dodge one strike and block the other. He remembers that most people use their guardians to buy time for spell casting, but Cheyenne is using his guardian to directly attack, which surprises him. Even Professor Edward is taken aback by the sight of Cyan's guardian, remarking that a student's skill level shouldn't be this advanced. The scouts from the fire faction also take notice, and their leader asks for information about Cheyenne. His subordinates inform him that Cheyenne is the head of the Ulster House, famous for its mastery of fire magic. According to the Watcher's reports, Cyan is gifted, but not supposed to be on par with the top three students. A scout leader realizes that something has pushed Cyan to surpass his previous limits and muses that students are unpredictable adding that the Grand Magic Festival is proving to be quite fruitful. He instructs his subordinates to report to Cariot about this unexpected development. Back in the Burning Forest, both Cyan and Will are exhausted. Will acknowledges that Cyan has grown stronger, while Cyan urges him to give it everything he's got, just like when he fought the evil Sentinel. Will doesn't understand why they have to fight at all, stating that he has no reason to. Cyan can't believe Will's words, considering all the times he's felt humiliated by him and wonders if Will doesn't harbor any resentment. Will admits that he does that he's angry with Cyan and has often imagined getting revenge, but right now his priority is defeating Julius. Cyan, frustrated, demands that Will stop dodging the issue, confessing that he's always found Will to be an eyesore. Despite being labeled a no-talent, Will never gives up, which annoys Cyan. He's irritated by how Will always seems to focus on someone else, never on him, and begs Will not to ignore him, but to look directly at him. Will ponders if this has been Cyan's perspective all along. Cyan, uncaring about Will's inner turmoil, insists that he just wants to fight. Will realizes that while he never sought recognition, deep down he did crave it. If Cyan acknowledges him and Will is determined to face him with everything he has, Cyan, finally feeling that Will is paying attention to him, is pleased and immediately commands his guardian to attack. But Will knows that charging directly at Cyan would be suicidal, since the guardian would overwhelm him, so he decides to counterattack at the precise moment Cyan casts his spell. As Cheyenne bombards him with spells and the Guardian's attacks, Will easily dodges, having anticipated their trajectories. He then destroys the Guardian's core and charges straight at Cyan. Cyan, readying another spell, prepares to meet Will head-on. But before they can clash, Cole erects a wall between them, halting the fight. Both are startled to see her and wonder where Julius is. However, Cole confidently states that she beat Julius into submission, and then he vanished. They're stunned by her claim and Cyan, flustered, notices her peak appearance, which she finds unladdy-like. Anoe Cole snaps that it's their fault she looks like this, and that none of this would have happened if they hadn't started fighting. She then urges Will to go and settle things with Julius, promising to handle everything here. Shan protests, not wanting her to interfere with their fight, but she angrily reminds him that he was the one who interfered first. She points out that this was supposed to be Will's chance to demonstrate his power to the tower. Will Grateful covers Cole up, which embarrasses her into silence, he then tells Cyan they'll have a proper fight another time and takes off. Meanwhile, Julius' squad arrives at the stadium first and Mike announces that there's nothing stopping them from claiming victory. But as he's confident they're about to win, Will suddenly leaps into the stadium, challenging Julius. The scene then shifts to Elferia, who is seated in her room at the top of the tower. Suddenly, a woman named Cerisa enters to speak with her, only to find Elferia asleep. Cerisa wakes her with a sharp smack on the head, telling her to behave in a manner befitting her status. She points out that Elferia is always either sleeping or staring down at the base of the tower. But when Elferia finally asks what Cerisa wants, Cerisa hands her some papers to review. She explains that these documents contain the names of candidates recommended by the scouts, and she notes that they had a particularly successful harvest this year. She shows Elferia information about Julius, suggesting that he would be an excellent candidate for the Ice Faction. Cerisa adds that Julius is currently performing in the games and might even be worthy of becoming Elferia's successor. The scene then cuts to Will, who is about to face off against Julius in the games. 
Mike announces that Will is now up against all three members of Squad 9, with Julius expressing relief that Will made it in time. Julius remarks that he was worried about winning too easily, and says it wouldn't be as satisfying if he couldn't crush Will without humiliating him. Will, however, declares that he has no intention of losing before making Julius apologize to Donan and the others. Julius continues to mock Will, saying he talks big, but is nothing more than a rat in his presence. He then uses his ice magic to create a mist that envelops the arena. However, Will senses the magic of Julius and his teammates through the fog and realizes they are trying to surround him. Suddenly, an ice spell attacks him from behind, which he narrowly dodges. He starts moving to avoid being a stationary target and dodges two more similar attacks. But having evaded an attack from each of them, Will believes he knows their locations and attempts to strike Julius. However, he is surprised when he is hit by another ice attack from an unexpected direction. The real Julius then reveals that neither he nor his team has moved at all. It turns out that the figures Will had been tracking were merely Julius's clones, much to the astonishment of the arena spectators who now see five versions of Julius. Will wonders if this is an illusion, but quickly realizes it's not. Julius explains that his clones have the ability to explode. One of the clones approaches, Will then detonates, and although Will manages to shield himself from harm, he becomes encased in ice. Edward is also shocked to see the multiple Julius clones and recognizes the spell being used. Work reveals that Julius is using a secret magic developed by Elferia, who accomplished a great feat by creating 12 original spells, which is why a serial art is named after her. Julius is using one of those spells which Will recognizes as well, acknowledging that it creates living sculptures of the caster. He confusedly asks Julius how he is able to use the same spell as Elferia, but Julius, laughing, replies that it's because of his talent, bragging that he learned the spell on his own. He adds that although it's only the first spell in the series, he has already reached the level of a Mangia Vander. He further boasts that Albus Vina is not that special and declares that one day, he will take everything from her. Angered by Julius's words, Will shatters the ice trapping him and charges directly at Julius. Julius and his clones launch a barrage of ice boulders at Will, but Will effortlessly slices through each one. Julius continues to cast spells, proudly stating that he can control his clones and make them cast spells as well. Julius's teammates remark that Will is doomed if he remains stationary. Julius then stops attacking and uses his clones to encase Will in a barrier. Will tries to break free by slashing at it, but the barrier remains intact and he realizes he is trapped. Julius, confident, comments that it's easy to hunt a wild animal when it's cornered and attacks Will with a massive ice boulder, claiming this will end the fight. The audience is stunned by Julius's power and Mike announces that Julius has won the battle without even moving from his spot. Edward reflects that this is the ideal for all mages and understands why Julius has accumulated over 10,000 credits. Julius then uses his wand as a microphone to tell the scouts that he can master Albus Venina's spell on his own. He declares that he will be Elferia's successor, leaving the students in awe, as they believe no one can defeat him if he can use a Mangiavander's spell. Iris, however, explains that this is all a show pointing out that Julius cleverly exploited Will's incredible strength and agility to make himself look good. Rosti adds that Julius will look foolish if he loses now. Soon after, Will breaks out of the ice boulder, much to Julius's amazement. Will thanks Julius for the ice spell, saying it helped him cool his head, as he tends to get worked up when it comes to Elfie. Annoyed by Will's chatter, Julius declares that he will finish him off for good this time, and along with his clones, launches another round of spells. But Will dodges them and takes down Julius's teammates in one swift move. Edward realizes this is the same technique Will used against him, and the crowd is thrilled by the sudden turn of events. Julius's ice clones begin to crumble, and the audience wonders what's happening. Will explains that Julius was relying on his friends to help control his clones, which is the only reason he could use Elfie's spell for a brief time. Will then tells Julius that he is nowhere near Elferia's level. Back at the tower, Elferia reflects on the reports and considers that Julius might indeed have the potential to become her successor, if the information is accurate. However, she reveals that what she truly desires by her side is not a successor, but a sword. Meanwhile, Will tells Julius that his magic is flawed, pointing out that unlike autonomous guardians, Julius's magic is entirely controlled by the caster. He explains that Julius' teammates were the only reason he could control his clones effectively, Furious at being lectured by someone he considers talentless, especially one who can't even use magic, Julius attacks Will by summoning a swarm of roses. Will cuts through them, but Julius causes the roses to explode, forcing Will to defend himself against the blast. Julius then creates four more clones and launches a series of magical attacks from all of them. Will manages to dodge or counter every attack. Julius admits that right now he's not skilled enough to control four clones simultaneously without his teammates' help. 
He acknowledges that the spell drains his energy quickly, but he believes that we will never figure out which one of the clones is the real him since they all look identical. Confident in his deception, Julius laughs, thinking Will is helpless. However, Will surprises him by charging forward. Julius hastily creates an ice wall for protection, but Will shatters it with his sword, sending ice shards flying. One shard strikes Julius, prompting him to ask how Will managed to identify the real one. Will calmly explains that the average body temperature of Arsvise's clones is the exact opposite of the casters, around 36 or 37 degrees Celsius or even lower, depending on how the spell is cast. If the caster isn't fully in control, the cold leaks out, and just like with Frostwalkers, ice crystals form around their feet. Julius realizes that Will is right and watches as his clones disintegrate once more. Stunned that a no-talent like Will knows more about the spell than he does, Julius demands an explanation. Will reveals that Elfaria is his childhood friend and because they were both abandoned and grew up in the same orphanage, he knows a great deal about her magic. He admits that he has always admired her abilities and has studied her magic deeply, though he could never reach her level. Will then tells Julius that he knows all the strengths and weaknesses of Elfaria's magic. This revelation makes Julius uneasy and he angrily declares that he won't allow someone like Will to mock the magic of Mangia Vander. He attacks Will with an ice spell, but Will effortlessly cuts through it. Will praises Julius, acknowledging that no other mage has ever been able to use Elfaria's magic before. However, he reminds Julius that Arsvice is a spell Elfaria created when she was only two years old. Hearing this, Julius starts to lose hope. Will adds that the spell is not perfect and can be easily countered, telling Julius that boasting about such a spell makes him nothing more than the naked king. Julius is crushed by the realization that he was so proud of mastering a spell created by a child, and he begins to feel like he's no better than an infant. Overwhelmed by frustration, he creates seven clones, vowing to defeat Will with sheer numbers. Julius unleashes multiple ice spells at once, but Will remains unfazed, revealing that this is nothing compared to being bullied by ten of Elfaria's clones when he was a kid. Vexed, Julius launches his attack, but Will dodges every spell and swiftly takes down one of the clones. Desperate, Julius tries to stop Will with the remaining clones and attempts to flee, but Will systematically destroys all of the clones, evading or blocking their attacks with ease. Will then heads straight for Julius, landing a punch that knocks out one of Julius's teeth and renders him unconscious. Everyone in the arena is stunned by this turn of events. Mike announces Will's victory, astonished that someone considered a no-talent has defeated a mage with over 10,000 credits. Rosti is shocked and Lena takes note of Will's prowess. Colette and Sen also arrive at the arena. Mike then states that all Will has to do now is claim the crown. However, before Will can act, Wigmilt picks up the crown and places it on his own head, leaving the crowd astounded. Mike declares Wigmill the winner, marking the end of the Grand Magic Games. Sarisa informs Elfaria of the outcome, and we see that Elfaria is too embarrassed to show her face. She wonders if there's a spell that could erase memories or turn back time. Sarisa mentions that such a forbidden spell might exist, but she won't allow Elfaria to use it. With teary eyes, Elfaria insists that Will is wrong. She wasn't bullying him, she just wanted to keep him all to herself so they could always play together. She can't believe that the students now know about her dark past. Back at the arena, Cheyenne is surprised that Will managed to defeat Julius as well. He leaves determined to one day defeat Will. Colette asks Will if he's okay and Will apologizes for their loss but says that at least he was able to keep his promise. That evening at the tavern, everyone celebrated Will's victory over Julius. The dwarves express their gratitude to Will for fighting on their behalf and Work thanked them for looking after Will. The dwarves modestly claim they didn't do much but Work still asked them to continue watching over our zesty boy. Later that night, Cole shared her disappointment that Will wasn't scouted by the tower. She speculated it was because their team had fought among themselves and didn't even win the event. Cole blamed Cyan for everything, and Will explained that Cheyenne had rudely rejected their invitation to join the celebration. The old dwarf reassured Will not to worry about not being scouted, reminding him that he won the fight for their honor and got the apology he wanted. The best part was that Julius, as punishment, was now working in the tavern. Julius dutifully followed his boss's orders but lamented that he wouldn't get scouted now all because of no talent will. Julius channeled his frustration into hard work. Cole noticed that work seemed concerned and he explained that things might change from now on. Will had shown a lot of his capabilities during the festival and work wondered how Will would handle things when he returned to the academy. Cole assumed that the other students would now have newfound respect for Will, but Work warned that it might not be what they expected. When they returned to school, some students asked Will to join them in the dungeon. They hesitantly admitted that Will had incredible strength and begged him to choose their team for the upcoming week-long dungeon dive practice. 
Just then, another group interrupted, not wanting another team to steal Will away since they were also planning to ask him to join their team. More students jumped in, and soon Will was swarmed with requests to join teams. Cole called them all shameless for wanting Will on their teams after years of bullying him. She assumed Will felt the same way, but she was wrong. Will couldn't be happier to be wanted by everyone. Cole realized she had completely lost him, and that Will had been deprived of friends for too long. But someone accused Cole of keeping Will all to herself, and a girl offered to split the dungeon dive credits with Will. She then stepped in, saying that Will couldn't team up with anyone because they had plans to go shopping that night. However, Cole then panicked, realizing she had inadvertently turned their plans into what seemed like a date. That night, her friend Rose teased her about it, but advised her to prepare even if Cole insisted it wasn't a real date. But Cole finally gave in and Rose suggested she wear something cute. Will mentioned his plans with Cole to Roasty, explaining that Cole had kind of persuaded him by saying they needed to buy equipment for the practice. Rosty was happy to hear Will would be shopping alone with Cole and smiled mischievously. The next day, Cole waited for Will, determined to turn their shopping trip into a date. When she saw Will, she was in awe, and Will complimented her on her new look, saying she made his heart race, which made her freak out. Just then, they were both surprised when Rosty showed up, apologizing for being late. Rosty introduced himself to Cole and Will explained that Rosty insisted on coming along. Cole was horrified by this turn of events, and Rosty taunted her. Throughout the shopping trip, Rosty kept getting in the way whenever Cole tried to interact with Will. Eventually, Will noticed something was bothering Cole, so she pointed out that his closeness with Rosty was odd. Will assured her that Rosty was a good guy who just liked to act sassy at times. Rosty then bought them drinks but didn't get one for himself so he could share with Will. Cole refused to let that happen and offered to share hers instead. Tensions rose between the two, so Rosie suggested that Will go ahead and get his sword fixed while they stayed behind, saying the dwarves wouldn't be happy if mages like them showed up at their forge. After he left, Cole confronted Rosty, demanding to know why he refused to leave Will's side. Rosty didn't hold back and explained that he cared about Will more than anyone else in the world. The two then argued fiercely about who was closer to Will, with Rosty bragging that they bathed together every night. Meanwhile, Will finally started to wonder if his friends didn't like each other. At that moment, Lehanna, who was known as the complete opposite of Will, suddenly appeared and asked him to follow her. Will, curious about what she wanted, followed her to a house where he saw the other top students. Lehanna revealed that, as they were entering the final term of their last year at the academy, it was time for the all-student practice. She wanted to form a party with the five of them. Julius and Cyan couldn't understand why Lehanna had invited Will, and Will thought about how these were the two people who hated him the most. Lehanna mistook his terrified expression as a refusal, leading Will to realize she was a bit of an airhead. Cyan, now wanting to be ignored, angrily moved to confront Will, but before he could, Wigmel used his powerful magic to change her entire surroundings. Wigmel pointed out that mages weren't as barbaric as the dwarves, which made Cyan stop being a jerk. Wigmel had used delusion magic, a unique type of magic that summoned fantasy landscapes, a skill granted only to the elves. With things calming down, Wigmel wanted to hear what Lehanna had to say. Lehan explained that she wanted to form a party for the dungeon dive, combining the four strongest mages with the person who stood out the most at the festival. She believed Will had something they were lacking, and that it would help them in the dungeon. Julius disagreed, arguing that Will couldn't use search magic and would only slow them down. Cyan, having been in a party with Will recently, didn't want to do it again. Wignall, however, points out that Julius and Cyan are just bitter about losing to Will, but Will still feels insulted. He then continues, explaining what they refuse to admit, that Will possesses the brute strength of the dwarves and agility akin to a monster, even if his fighting style lacks sophistication. Despite that, Will's sword managed to defeat both of their wands. However, Julius doesn't take Wignall's words lightly, retorting that Wignall is still behind Lehanna in credits. He argues that this is even more reason to respect her opinion. If she sees something in Will, then Wignall sure as well. Wignall ultimately decides to respect the no talent, which is more than he can say for Julius and Cyan a comment that irritates them. Lehanna then reveals her true goal. She wants to harness all of their power to ascend the tower as the top student. She desires more fame, honor, and a better future for herself. Although she was scouted at the festival and now has a guaranteed post-graduation placement, it isn't enough. In her family, members typically die young, and to prevent their total ruin, Lehanna must deliver overwhelming results. Simply ascending the tower won't suffice, she also needs to become a Manji Vander. However, Lehanna is confident that each of them has their own ambitions, so she instructs the guys to drop a coin in a cup if they agree to her proposal. Wignall agrees immediately, believing there won't be another party capable of achieving better results. Julius, wanting more credits, also feels he has no choice but to agree. Cheyenne also tosses in his coin as well, 
leaving only Will to decide. Later that night, Will returns to his worried friends who had gone looking for him by the forge but couldn't find him. Will, looking serious, announces that he has decided to join Lehanna's party for the practice dungeon dive. The next day, Orc explains that the practice will begin in 10 days. Floors 7 through 10 of the dungeon, which were previously off-limits, will be unlocked, allowing students to battle level 5 enemies and other high-credit monsters. This is the only chance for students to earn more than 1,000 credits at once, making it a significant opportunity. Most importantly, if students can defeat any of the floor keepers, they will earn a substantial number of credits. In theory, students could even earn full practice credits in one go. Edward, addressing the students, warns them that there is also a real risk of losing their lives. Just last year, four students were eaten by monsters. He advises them to forget about playing the hero as recklessness is forbidden. Professors will be stationed nearby, but that hasn't prevented fatalities in the past. As the students enter the dungeon, Lehanna notes that she never invited Colette, but Colette doesn't care and declares that she's going if Will is. Rosti wasn't allowed to join, but Will was happy that Rosie at least prepared a lot of magic items for him. As the practice begins, students are informed that base camps have been set up on each floor, and if the lower levels prove too dangerous, they should retreat to safety immediately. With that, the practice commences, and Will puts on his battle goggles. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the dungeon, someone is instructed to retrieve something in secret. Another person with them brutally removes someone's head from their body. Will's thoughts are focused on impressing Elfie during the session. But before he can grasp the plan, Wigmel uses wind magic to launch the group into the air at an incredible speed, quickly covering ground. They start to fall and Will panics, wondering what's happening. Fortunately, they all stop just before hitting the ground, gently landing, except for Will, who crashes face first into the dirt. Suddenly, the cave behind them explodes and a giant crimson ant emerges. Will thinks it's just one monster and not a big deal, but they've stumbled upon an ant colony, with a horde of ants swarming toward them. Will knows mages aren't great in close combat, so he readies his sword to deal with the monsters. Wignall, however, stops him, telling him to watch. Lehanna then speeds past them, and Wignall explains that she comes from a family of knights, making her an exception among mages due to her close combat skills. As they move ahead, things aren't going as well planned. He remembers Walk telling him about a basic spell called Search, which helps find monsters in the area, but since he can't use it, he struggles to locate them. Another monster appears behind Will, catching him off guard, but Julius freezes it and tells Will to stay out of the way. Will realizes that if this keeps up, he won't be able to kill you in a single beast. Soon, Wignall uses a massive wind blade to decimate all the monsters around them. Wignall comments on Will's lack of contribution, but Lehanna defends him saying he didn't have the chance to step into his role yet and believes they'll appreciate his presence later. Will tries to snap out of his funk and help, but he's still ineffective, as the monsters are killed before he even gets a good look at them. He ends up just following the group around the dungeon like a pack mule while they handle the enemies. Eventually, Lehanna checks her watch and tells everyone it's been a full day, so they should take a break. They're in the middle of a cave, which isn't safe, so Wignall uses elven magic to create an illusion of a firewall that won't harm them, but will scare away any monsters. Lehanna instructs Will to distribute the rations, so he drops his pack and hands out food. When he approaches Wignall, though the elf tells him to leave the food on the ground, not wanting Will to come near him, deeming him unworthy. Call is horrified by the discrimination and starts yelling at Wignall, who insists he doesn't want to be touched by anyone but Lehanna, since they're all mages and he's an elf. He only lets Lehanna touch him because he considers her worthy. Will tells Call to let it go and sits by himself, thinking about how lucky the elven race is. Like the dwarves, elves aren't from this world but are extremely gifted in magic, earning respect from humans. Even at the top of all, Magia Vander is the elven queen who commands them all. Lehanna soon calls a meeting, announcing that they're heading to the 10th floor where a boss monster named Neighborus resides. She explains that slaying Neighborus will earn them 110 credits, a significant amount, and since there's only one of this beast, they need to ensure they're the ones to kill it. She reveals that she formed this party specifically to slay Nabarus to get noticed by upper institutes and scouts. Wigmel questions whether it's wise to go straight for the main target without facing smaller monsters first, but Lehanna dismisses his concerns with a snide remark saying she wants to face Nabarus with their full strength and mana. They can deal with smaller monsters afterward. She asks if anyone objects and though Will knows the boss monster will be dangerous, he also means the credits, so he agrees. They reach the 10th floor, where to their surprise, many monsters are already dead on the ground. Will wonders if someone got there before them, but Cheyenne insists it's impossible since they took the shortest route and skipped all the base camps. Will inspects one of the dead monsters and realizes it was killed with brute force rather than magic, which seems suspicious. 
Despite this, they continue deeper into the floor, only to find Neighborus, the three-headed dog, already slain. The mages are terrified and immediately start using search magic, all while recalls Walk telling him that search magic has flaws as a mage can cloak themselves, and there are also monsters that can do the same. Will's heart races as he spots red eyes in the distance. The monster charges a beam and fires it at them. Will tells everyone to step back and manages to block the beam with his sword, deflecting it. But before they can process what's happening, the monster appears behind Wignall and slams him into a wall, drawing blood. The remaining mages begin casting spells, but the monster slams the ground, shaking the entire foundation. The floor beneath them shatters, and they all start falling. Will lunges toward an unconscious Wignall, and saves him during the fall. They land in a strange lair on a completely different floor. Cheyenne and Julius are also there, unable to believe they've fallen to the 11th floor, which is outside the Academy's territory, so they can't expect rescue. Lehanna, bleeding from her head, wonders if they'll ever make it out alive as the 11th floor is much more dangerous than the others and only high-ranking mages are allowed there. This fear proves valid when a massive snake attacks Will, but he manages to decapitate it, snapping Wignall back to reality. Wignall is stunned that Will killed the beast alone. Will tries to help Wignall up, but Wignall slaps his hand away, claiming he can manage on his own. He starts bandaging his arm while Will assesses their situation, realizing they've lost most of their gear. They have enough supplies to survive for two days at most, but on the 11th floor, they'll be lucky to last a single day. Will suggest they look for Call and the others, as that's their best chance of survival. Wignall wants to sit tight and wait for help, per Academy rules, but Will argues that with a monster on the 10th floor, no one will be coming to save them quickly. Will's prediction is correct as two Academy professors have been killed and crucified on the rocks, and a horde of monsters is stamping the base camp on the 8th floor. Professor Eliza tries to manage the chaos while Walk realizes something is definitely wrong. Professor Edward runs up to him, announcing that the event is cancelled and that they're going in because the situation is serious. Back on the 11th floor, Wignall continues using search magic, but Will advises him to take it easy, pointing out that he'll only tire himself out. Will suggests that he and Kiki handle the nearby monsters while Wignall searches for those farther away, adding that they should minimize fighting. Wignall is surprised by Will's calmness in such a dire situation, but Will has been in similar situations before and knows the dungeons well. Suddenly, they sense a monster approaching, three pig monsters trying to surround them. Will decides to take on the two in front, leaving the one in the back to Wignall. The elf uses wind magic to blast his monster away and turns around, shocked to see Will slicing through the other two with incredible speed, dodging their attacks and delivering lethal blows. Wignall realizes his monster isn't dead yet as it rushes toward him. With little time to counter, Wignall tries to use illusion magic to push the monster back, but Will yells at him not to. To Wignall's shock, the monster pushes through the illusion magic and is about to kill him, but Will steps in and slashes the monster in half. Wignall sits there stunned while Will explains that these pig monsters are blind so illusions don't work on them. This realization shatters Wignall, who admits that he's always been the one who's truly a loser. Six years had passed and all the other elves from the academy had already ascended the tower, leaving Wignall as the only one who remained. He was shunned by the others because, unlike typical elven magic that could turn illusions into solid forms, his magic only produced intangible phantasms. This made it useless for combat. Will was puzzled, as Wignall was ranked among the top three students and praise is gifted by everyone. The elf reminded him of Lehanna's comments about the remaining students at the academy being the less capable ones. Meanwhile, Lehanna explained this further to Cole, revealing that students who proved their worth ascended the tower, regardless of their academic status. Those left behind weren't considered valuable. Her nickname, Miss Perfect, only held weight within the academy, while in the outside world, they were nobodies. The true genius, Elfie, had become a Magia Vander in her first year. Lehanna stated that those without exceptional talent could never hope to compare to such prodigies. Cole then used Will as an example of someone striving to achieve his goals despite the doubts others had about his abilities. The focus returned to Wignall, who continued his sorrowful tale. He explained that he and Eleanor had grown up together, and he had harbored deep feelings for her. He believed he would always be by her side to support her. One day, while he demonstrated his magic, she tried it herself and ended up creating a Kingswood, marking her as a mighty high elf. She was taken away, leaving him devastated. Eleanor had become a Magia Vander, and since then, Wignall had trained hard to catch up with her but never succeeded. To mask his insecurity, he began to look down on other mages. After hearing this, Will realized why he had always sensed a similarity between them. He reassured Wignall that he was an amazing elf and vowed to protect him until he could stand on his own. Wignall, still in awe of Will's endurance as he easily cut down high-credit monsters, couldn't understand why someone would risk their life to protect him, 
when even his own people had abandoned him. Will, who had no magic, didn't think Wignall was a bad person at heart. Suddenly, Kiki alerted them to an approaching threat. Will quickly noticed that the dungeon was spawning monsters. He destroyed the organ responsible, but it unleashed a horde of ball cars, creatures unique to their current floor. These monsters had flame bodies that were immune to physical attacks and resistant to magic, making them a nightmare for mages. The only thing that could defeat them was elven illusion magic. With no choice but to fight, we'll turn to Wignall for help. However, the elf reminded him that his illusion magic was flawed. Overwhelmed with doubt, Wignall started crying convinced he would fail. But we'll told him that failure was a necessary step, and they would fail together if they had to. He urged Wignall forward, insisting that they shared the same goal of reaching the tower, and he had no plans to die before they did. Charging ahead to distract the monsters, we'll bought Wignall time. The elf tried casting his illusion magic, but it failed, forcing Kiki to step in and block the monster's combined attack. Will reassured Wignall that he believed in him. Not wanting to betray that trust, Wignall focused and managed to cast a wind spell that finally took physical form, destroying the monsters. Exhausted, Wignall dropped to his knees, apologizing to Will for his earlier rudeness and acknowledging him as a warrior worthy of respect. Will, in turn, admitted that he had always respected Wignall and had been watching him train all along. With mutual respect now established, the two shook hands. Will, using one of Rusty's magic items called the Seeker Map, creates a blood map to help guide the group. Meanwhile, Kiki also tracks Cole and Cyan's scent, further aiding their navigation. As they move, Julius and Cyan almost fall into an ambush set by evil sentinels. In typical fashion, the two have a comedic exchange, but Cyan becomes enraged upon recognizing the species. His greatest humiliation had come at their hands. Determined for revenge, he steps forward to burn them all, instructing Julius to create ice clones as decoys. At the same time, the evil sentinels launch an attack on the student camps. Edward quickly steps in, eliminating the threat with ease and giving orders for all students to evacuate. Work swoops down to pick up Edward as they make their way to the lower floors, knowing that Lehanna's party is the only one that made it to this level. Work, equipped with a gem that resonates with the one on Kiki's head, confirms that Lehanna's group is on the 11th floor. Cole, meanwhile, has been dropping stones to mark their location for the others. Eventually, Will and Wignall reunite with Cheyenne and Julius, who have successfully defeated the evil Sentinels. Meanwhile, Lehanna and Mars stumble upon their enemies. The villains have tried to use the severed head of their teacher to lure them in, but Lehanna stops them. It's revealed that Headless, a creature wearing Bruno's head, was behind the ruse. Headless greets the two ladies and Mars questions why he's here as he was supposed to handle things upstairs. Headless muses over how the students managed to make it down this far, suspecting that Duke, the earlier monster, must have failed to kill them. He assumes Duke destroyed the floor, allowing the students to descend. Mars is exasperated, realizing their cover has been blown thanks to Headless incompetence. Upon seeing Bruno's severed head, Cole pieces together that these villains killed their professor. Pointing her wand at them, she demands to know who they are. Headless casually crushes Bruno's head, proclaiming that they are simply villains intent on destroying the fake sky. Cole immediately realizes they're referring to the Great Barrier of the Mangiavander. According to lore, Calamity will befall the world once that barrier is destroyed. Headless grins and announces that since the students are there, he might as well take their heads too. Just as he attacks, Cole arrives in the nick of time, apologizing for being late. The rest of the group shows up, and the girls wonder how they found them. Will explains it was thanks to Kiki and the trail of ores Cole left behind. Upon noticing the headless figure, Shine questions who the enemies are. Headless becomes excited at the sight of so many cute heads, and Will charges at him. However, Headless counters, sending Will flying. Headless, impressed by their skills, expresses a desire to add their heads to his collection. Mars, however, drags him away, reminding him that they don't have much time to retrieve the item they need. Before leaving, Headless casts a spell learned from the Mage Queen, summoning Duke to the floor. The students are shocked, as Will identifies the creature as an evil Grand Duke, a monster with a credit rating of 270. The 1 to 1000 rule is the standard in the tower for assigning credits. A monster worth one credit is equal to a mage with a thousand credits. The evil Grand Duke is as powerful as a mage with 270,000 credits. Will warns everyone of an incoming attack, and they narrowly manage to dodge it. Julius is stunned by the monster's strength. A magicless student suggests retreating while they still can, and Lehanna orders the group to do so. Wignall creates a tree barrier to give them time to escape, but the monster easily breaks through. Will steps in to save Wignall from the creature's attack, and they manage to reach the exit before it collapses behind them. Now outside, the group has a moment to assess their situation. 
From Will's readings, he knows that the evil Grand Duke is a monster usually found on the 25th floor, one of the highest-ranking members of the evil monster family. Lehanan is convinced that the villains summoned it. Meanwhile, lesser evil monsters are already searching for them, acting under the Grand Duke's command, leaving no clear escape route. Lehanna can see that the party is exhausted, injured, and in a dire situation. The weight of despair threatens to overwhelm them. However, Will refuses to give in. He declares that their only option is to slay the Grand Duke. If they defeat its leader, it will likely open a path for the rescue team to reach them. Julius can't believe that someone like Will, without any special talent, would think they could defeat such a powerful monster. But Will reveals that he has a plan, though the Ice Mage is skeptical. Wignall, however, stands up for Will, reminding everyone how Will's quick thinking and selflessness saved him earlier. Cole agrees with the plan, and Cheyenne believes that fighting is their only choice if escape is impossible. Wignall then urges Lehanna to trust Will's idea. Acknowledging Will's leadership, Lehanna admits she was wrong to think of him as just their shield when he was always meant to be her leader. He's the only one who hasn't been overtaken by despair, so Lehanna decides to entrust everything to Will. She addresses him by his first name, a sign of deep trust. Will accepts the responsibility and promises to bring everyone back alive. Julius is in disbelief at what's happening. Will turns to the Ice Mage and asks for his support, offering to share the secret behind Elfie's ice spell. Reluctantly, Julius agrees and the group prepares for their plan. Elfie's ice spell, as revealed, allows the caster to use clones to maintain a long incantation, with each clone continuing the chant from where the previous one left off. Julius demonstrates this, managing to keep his spell going even as the Grand Duke destroys his clones. The others defend Julius as he finishes the incantation, but their attacks fail to harm the monster. Will remembers from his studies that the Grand Duke's wings are impenetrable. Julius unleashes his ultimate ice spell, but the Grand Duke blocks it. Will had anticipated this, so they set Lehanna up to deliver the final blow. However, a hidden barrier protects the Duke, leaving her attack useless. Will rushes to evacuate her and calls on Kiki to put up a magic shield. Although most of the blasts are deflected, one sneaks through and shatters the special goggles that Elfie had given Will. They manage to land safely, but Will is shaken when he sees the broken goggles. His shock renders him unresponsive to the team's calls. Meanwhile, the evil Grand Duke smashes through the ice barrier, forcing Lehanna to order a retreat. She vows to give her life to buy enough time for the others to escape, revealing that members of House Owenzas have short lives because they are knights who shield their allies. Wignall decides to stay behind with her, ready to fight the monster by her side. As they dash forward, Shyam struggles with the thought of fleeing, but Will interrupts him, asking to be punched. The magicless student admits he's lost control of his fear now that Elfie's goggles are broken. Furious, the redhead begins hitting Will, blaming him for leading them into this battle. Will eventually stops the blows and smiles, saying that the punches helped stop his trembling. With a newfound sense of calm, he stands up, ready to continue the fight. Will grips his sword, ready for battle. Cheyenne is stunned by his resolve, so Cole explains that Will is always terrified, unlike mages who fight from a distance. Will has to engage dangerous monsters up close with his sword, but despite his fear, Will overcomes it through sheer courage, inspiring Cole to rise and fight as well. Cyan, not wanting to be outshone, pushes himself to join the battle. As Will dashes forward, he focuses on finding a way to cut through the Duke's seemingly impenetrable wings, knowing that this is the key to victory. His greatest fear is losing his comrades, and when he looks to Cole, she already understands what he needs. The Duke strikes, but Will has seen this attack before and manages to evade it, preparing for a counter. Leaping into the air, he uses a giant magical blade that Cole creates to slice through one of the Duke's wings. Yet the monster still stands. Cyan, refusing to be a coward, unleashes a high-level spell, but the Duke remains unmoved. Their efforts, sword and magic alone, aren't enough. Suddenly, Rosti finds them and tosses a crystal to Will. When he grabs it, visions flood his mind, an injured Elfie and a wound holding a baby whispering that one day the wand and sword will unite. This vision spurs Will into action. He races to his blade and asks Cheyenne for fire magic. Watching through Kiki's gem, the professors are astonished as Will's sword absorbs the fire magic, transforming into an epic flame blade. Will's vision turns red as newfound strength surges through him. Dodging the Duke's attacks, he channels his power and slices the monster clean in half with a powerful technique called East Wise. This then marks the end of today's anime recap. If you've enjoyed the video and want more of it, please support the channel by leaving a like and subscribe. Let's help us reach our current goal of 20k subscribers.